Hey, Future Hindsight listeners. My name is Jenna Spinelli, and I am one of the hosts of the Democracy Works podcast. Every week, we examine a different aspect of what it means to live in a democracy. Sometimes it's big topics like demagoguery or neoliberalism, and other times it's more tangible, topical things like voting by mail, and how COVID-19 is impacting campaigning and organizing. If you enjoy Future Hindsight, I think you'll enjoy Democracy Works too. You can check it out at democracyworkspodcast.com or by searching Democracy Works in your favorite podcast app. You can find new episodes of Democracy Works every Monday, again, at democracyworkspodcast.com or by searching Democracy Works in your podcast app. Welcome to Future Hindsight. I'm your host, Mila Atmos. Each week, I speak with citizen changemakers who spark civic engagement in our society. Our guest today is Lee McIntyre. He's the author of Post-Truth, and he's also a research fellow at the Center for Philosophy and History of Science at Boston University and an instructor in ethics at Harvard Extension School. I've been thinking about how we have come to arrive at our current post-truth era and what it might take to get out of it. So we're doing a whole season on how news and information is presented and manipulated in the media and our larger public discourse. To get us started and frame our thinking, we spoke to Lee. If you've ever been confused about the difference between fake news and propaganda, or you're really not sure what post-truth really means and what its purpose is, this is a perfect episode. I define post-truth as the political subordination of reality. I think that it's a tactic that authoritarians and their wannabes use to corrupt our belief, not just in specific truths, but in the idea that we have a way to pursue truth outside a political context. So I don't think it's really a, a failing of knowledge so much as one of politics. We discuss the role of decades of science denial and the rise of fake news in ushering in this post-truth era and what we can do to support the idea that truth matters and rebuild trust. Let's listen in. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So you wrote this beautiful book, Post-Truth, and I like that your title gets straight to the point without a subtitle. Let's go right to the meat of the matter. How do you define post-truth? There's a lot of confusion these days over what post-truth means. Post-truth doesn't mean that we don't care about truth anymore. It means that we live in an era when truth is at risk. I define post-truth as the political subordination of reality. I think that it's a tactic that authoritarians and their wannabes use to corrupt our belief, not just in specific truths, but in the idea that we have a way to pursue truth outside a political context. So I don't think it's really a, a failing of knowledge so much as one of politics. How are we susceptible to this kind of political manipulation of what we accept as truth? Post-truth didn't come out of nowhere. There are several roots. The first one is science denial. I talk about how the fact that we've had science denial for the past 60 or 70 years created a blueprint for what post-truth was going to look like because if you could deny the truth about climate change or evolution, you could deny the truth about just about anything like how many people were at an inauguration or the path of a hurricane. Some other roots are cognitive bias that's built into all of us through evolution. And then these days, the decline of traditional media and the rise of social media, really the internet has been the gas on the fire. So it's not that people have never lied before or people have never tried to manipulate reality for their own benefit. It's that these days it can happen much faster than it used to be able to happen more widespread. Can you give an example for how we have accepted some climate denial, because that's the easiest one, or even maybe with tobacco, and how that has worked in creating in our brains an idea that things are not settled and therefore there is doubt? Yeah, the blueprint for post-truth was 
60 or 70 years of science to now, the best example is maybe the one that you bring up where the tobacco companies freaked out in the 1950s because there was a scientific study that was going to show an all but causal link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. They hired a public relations specialist who advised them that what they needed to do was fight the science. And so they needed to manufacture doubt where there was none. And what happened with this is that it created the idea that you could manipulate public opinion simply by raising doubts. Uh, they didn't have to be scientific doubts. What they did was they exploited the idea that lay people have about science, which is that science is about certainty and proof, that you need 100% certainty before you're justified in believing something. And that's not actually the way that science works at all. So, And you see this ripple through climate change. Uh, you hear people say, well, have you proven that climate change is caused by greenhouse gases? Uh, you know, are your models 100%? Can you tell me what the temperature will be you know, in five years? Aha, if you can't, then they think that they've got enough room for doubt. But that's just the way that science works. Science is about warrant, not about proof. When we get enough evidence that it makes it reasonable to believe something, that's when science moves forward. People who are motivated not to believe something call themselves skeptics, wait for 100% proof, and then they never end up believing anything that they don't want to believe. Yeah, it's very convenient to do it that way. And we're seeing it that. Is. We're really seeing that right now in real life. Before we get there, I wanted to talk about what you said on the demise of traditional media and the fragmentation of the news industry together with the rise of social media. But let's start with the idea or the reality, I should say, that we now have partisan media outlets and they pursue essentially profit, whereas in the old days, it was that the news was only half an hour of a network's time, and they had investigative reporting, and they basically told you what's right and what's wrong and what's true and what's not. And once you had CNN and Fox News and MSNBC, they have morphed into purveyors of opinion as opposed to facts. And one of the things that they do is they present both sides of an issue and give false equivalence. Can you explain what false equivalence is? Because I think that's very ill understood. Sure. Uh, I think you're absolutely right about the, the history of the way that things have gone. The news media used to be that news was a loss leader for the stations. Uh, they had news divisions because their broadcast license said that they needed to do work in the public interest and the entertainment is where they made their money. After CNN, they discovered, well, you can make money on news and let's try 24-7 news. Well, then all of a sudden you've got to make money on it. It's much more expensive to do actual news, uh, investigative reporting than opinion. And so the opinion sort of took over. And the false equivalence that you talk about is important, especially for science debates. If you look at the way that the news media used to present science topics, and they still do to some extent, you would find a split screen debate where they would have somebody from the National Academy of Science talking about the importance of climate change. And then you'd have some climate denier who had a website and a following, and they would give them both equal time to talk. And then at the end, make it sound like it was a debate and look at the audience and say, you decide. That's maybe the worst possible way to present it because they're making it seem as if there's doubt where amongst the scientists there really isn't any. One reason that this happens is because the news media have always been uh, allergic to the idea that they would be accused of bias. And the simplest way to show that you're not biased is to let both sides talk. But th here's the problem. The halfway point between the truth and a lie is still a lie. It, it, objectivity in journalism doesn't mean that you're indifferent between truth and a lie. It means that you don't want to leave your audience less well informed after they finish watching your program than they were in the beginning. The media has changed a little bit the way that they do science reporting now, but they still, with uh, factual matters, are bending over backward too far to show that they're not politically biased and in some cases not reporting the truth. 
Yeah. Yeah. So the media right now, instead of uh, facilitating the truth by really doing objective reporting, they instead do this both sides isms in a reduced manner, of course. But still, when you do that, you confuse the public. So what would it actually look like? What would be good, truthful reporting, let's say, on the signs of climate change? Okay. There's a brilliant psychologist named George Lakoff who has a model called the truth sandwich, where he said that when you are reporting on a a factual matter that's in dispute, what you should do as a journalist is present the truth, then present what the person said that was a lie, and then fact check the lie. There's a way to make it clear that you don't present it as if both sides are equally credible. Reuters had a story a few months ago in which they found that climate change was now at the five sigma level, which means that there's only a one out of a million chance that the climate change deniers are correct. So why would anybody give equal time to that? If you think about it, they don't give equal time to flat earthers. They don't give equal time to people who claim that we never went to the moon. There are other sides of all sorts of debates where the facts have been settled a long time ago. But the the other side, if it's not based on any sort of warrant, any sort of evidence, any sort of reason, it doesn't deserve to be on the news. Yeah, well said. I think this leads me perfectly to my next question about fake news. What is fake news and how does it fit in with post-truth. These days, some people have said that we should stop using the term fake news, and I push back against that. Some people think that we shouldn't use the term because Trump has made it a a term of derision that he uses against the mainstream media, which is a tactic of post-truth. I think that we need to keep the term but realize what it really is. Fake news is news that is intentionally false. There are several different motivations for this. And in the 2016 election, we saw this. We saw propaganda out of Russia. We saw fake stories created in the United States about Hillary was dying or just things that people make up out of whole cloth and put it out there because they know that a certain number of people are going to click on it. And you can never correct it fully once the the misinformation has gotten out into the mainstream. And that's why fake news is so powerful. There's a hidden danger to fake news. Fake news is not just when you report something that's false and hope that somebody will take it as true. Just the very existence of fake news can have an effect where when the information stream is so polluted with false stories, people can become cynical and just stop believing that there is any such thing as truth at all outside of political context. And remember, that's the goal of post-truth. The goal of post-truth is to make people so cynical and just so uncertain and used to the chaos that they begin to believe that they really can't find the truth. One of my favorite quotations on this is by the uh, Holocaust historian Hannah Arendt, who said, in an ever-changing, incomprehensible world, the masses had reached the point where they would at the same time believe everything and nothing, think that everything was possible and nothing was true. That's the problem, right? Fake news is a tactic of authoritarians, you know, within the context of post-truth to try to get people to give up on the idea that they can know the truth because then the population's easier to rule. It creates an environment that is not conducive to democracy. That's absolutely right. If you'll indulge me, I've got another quotation from Hannah Arendt. She says, the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, true and false, no longer exists. That's a great quote. And I think people don't realize that most people are not partisan and aren't following politics closely or following civil discourse very closely. They're just bombarded every day with information that is both factual and false. And like you said, when you are in this onslaught of information, you can no longer discern what's true and what's not. It's really hard to say, yes, this is definitely true, or this thing is definitely not true, and I cannot believe that. And 
I have to act accordingly. And I have friends who are really well educated. They are just so exhausted to tell the difference that they give up. If you look at an authoritarian society, maybe they only have one media outlet. And so people become cynical that way because what they're hearing on the radio or on TV they know is a lie, but they don't know what the truth is. But there's another way to do that. Suppose you live in a free society where you have an independent media. Remember back to those tobacco executives. Fight the science, right? The free media is going to exist and they're going to be doing their investigative journalism and promoting truth. But if you create a counter narrative of lies and propaganda, then all of a sudden the people are not quite so sure which one is the truth and which one is not. You can hide something by hiding it so people can't see it, but you can also hide it in plain sight if you surround it with enough disinformation and misinformation. I don't know if you know the movie. It's Indiana Jones and the Holy Grail. Remember when he's trying to find the Holy Grail? It's not that the Holy Grail is not sitting right in front of him. It's surrounded by a thousand other cups, which also might be the Holy Grail. One of the things that you say in the book is that post-truth is pre-fascism. Can you explain what that means? Yes, I'm not the one who said that. That was Tim Snyder in his book On Tyranny. So the idea that he comes up with that post-truth is pre-fascism is simply this idea that when you have control over the information stream, you begin to have control over the populace, over the people. Another uh, favorite author of mine is Jason Stanley, who's a philosopher at Yale. He has a book called How Propaganda Works, in which he makes the following claim. He claims that propaganda isn't simply there to fool you. Propaganda exists because it's trying to rule you. It's trying to show, I'm so powerful that I can say a false thing and there's nothing that you can do about it. So that's the sense in which I think that Snyder makes the claim that post-truth is pre-fascism. Because if you pollute the information stream, if you overwhelm the truth, or you make people cynical about it, and you get them to believe that they can't know it, that truth is unobtainable, then you've got an enormously powerful weapon in social control. All of a sudden, you can tell lies. Even if you don't make them believe that the lie is true, you've overwhelmed their defenses. And like I said, they're easier to rule at that point. That's what I'm really afraid of. Post-truth is pre-fascism. That's why I'm so worried about it. Yeah. We're there now, I think, if I'm not mistaken. I think people no longer care so much about the truth. You know, people can sometimes even acknowledge that the president lies and then they shrug their shoulders and say, so what? He's getting away with it, he's getting away with everything and it doesn't matter. This particular moment is quite an interesting one because to the person who wants to use post-truth as a form of political control, the one key is that they get away with the lie. So when Trump lied about how many people were at his inauguration, or whether there was voter fraud so that he'd actually had more votes than Hillary Clinton. Even when he lied about the path of Hurricane Dorian, all of these lies, you might say, well, he wasn't accountable for them. You know, Yes, a lot of people knew that they were lies. A lot of people believed it. But there wasn't a moment of reckoning. There wasn't any hard correction from reality that made him have to take account of the fact that he lied. We're also on the cusp of a hard correction from reality through coronavirus. Uh, this is a moment when uh, th this can't be spun. This can be lied about, but as you know, we saw from what happened with the stock market, what happened with people panicking, even the people who are in the grip of believing a lie, they will eventually thirst for the truth. And in this case, the truth can save our lives. And I think that this is the moment of reckoning. How to fight post-truth, unfortunately, this is one way. I prefer other ways through awareness and uh, the truth sandwich and other things that I talked about. But sometimes reality provides its own antidote to post-truth. The best example I can think of here is back in the 1980s, 
when the space shuttle Challenger blew up. There was political manipulation that led them to launch the Challenger on a day when they shouldn't have launched it, and it blew up. There was an investigation afterward, and Richard Feynman said, for a successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. And we learned that when the space shuttle Challenger blew up. Nature can't be fooled now when Trump is saying, well, the coronavirus will disappear like a miracle, or we don't have that many cases, or the test kits will be available next week. These are all things that are easily fact-checked, but they're also things that affect people's lives. So we're awake. We're watching this. And I think that, unfortunately, this is the hard correction from reality that Trump has been stalking for the past three years, 14, 15,000 lies. And he finally comes to a set of lies where he's going to be held accountable. He's going to be held responsible, even by the people who have previously been on his side, because suddenly their lives are at risk. Yeah, it's uh, so true. I think the Challenger example is really perfect for our current crisis with coronavirus because also lives are at risk and it is a hard truth of nature and physics and science that we cannot deny. We cannot lie about it or he cannot lie about it, I should say. I do hope that this will be, like you said, a moment of reckoning for all of us to really embrace truth and go back to objectivity so for us as individuals, what are two things that I could be doing to support truth in our society? How can I be one of the people to push back when somebody tells a naked lie or a falsehood? I think there are two important things that I could say. One is that we have to begin to talk to one another again. We have to not just accept the fact that our society is polarized and fragmented and that we have competing news outlets. I think that if you look at how people change minds, it's through engagement. It's through trusting relationships, personal relationships. And, you know, if you watch speeches in Congress these days, you see one person standing in a microphone and all the chairs behind are empty. I mean, people in Congress aren't even talking to one another anymore. And I think that as individuals, we can start to listen to one another again, to build those relationships, to not shy away from the hard conversations. A second thing that we can do as individuals to support the idea that truth matters is to support the truth tellers. I tell people that they need to buy the subscription if they are interested in supporting good investigative journalism where people disclose conflicts of interest, where people double source things, where there are standards, they need to actually buy the subscription to make it clear that we're supporting truth tellers. I think that's one of the most important things that we can do. As you watch institutions crumble, make donations to the ones that you believe in. Help out the people who are trying to get the word out. I think that's very important. And those are things that I've done myself. I've engaged in conversations with people who disagree with me. And I've started to not only buy newspaper subscriptions, but to support organizations that I believe in that I think are important in this era. One of the things that you mention in the book is that repetition works, repeating the truth works. And I think it's really important to say that just like repeating fake news works, repeating the truth works also. So we really need to flood the information sphere also with truth and it will be easier to find. So let's say the coronavirus is truly a moment of reckoning. What would be a sign for you? What should we be looking out for that things are really turning for the better? I, I just heard a conversation where they were talking about that the people would rise up if Trump tried to fire Dr. Anthony Fauci for contradicting him. I mean, he's certainly done that in the past. He's had people who he's taken it out on when they've told things that he didn't like. In this moment, I don't think he could get away with it. I'm pleased to see that people are not uh, quite so tolerant of the fact that uh, there's political spin on this. My suspicion is that, you know, 
we're now at a moment where the stakes are so high, I think people are going to begin to realize that their future is really at stake here. Again, I think it's absolutely horribly unfortunate that it's come to this. The one good thing that will come out of it is that people will have new respect for the importance of truth. Yes, I hope you're right. Looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? We're realizing that we're in this together. I think that people are talking, people are listening, people are communicating with one another about what their fears are, about what the information that they have that is truthful. I've seen a lot of people making a grassroots effort, state and local government, but also just individual citizens, to put the truth out there, to gather the facts. And as you said, we've known for a long time, repeating a lie is a very effective way to get people to believe the lie. But repeating the truth works as well. So the more people that we have in the corner of truth, the more people that we have repeating the truth, reinforcing it, getting that information out there, not just in the news media, but on Facebook, on Twitter, the other things that people look at, and talking to family who disagree with this, making clear what the facts actually are. I think that's just very important. And I think that that's something that, that does give me hope. And I think that's the right track. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for being on Future Hindsight. Thank you so much. It's really hard to swallow that despite the realities of mounting COVID deaths and lack of testing, the absence of a vaccine or effective cure, the administration continues unabated on a campaign of obfuscation and lies. What's more, their bungling of the federal response has come to the point of looking like it's committing self-sabotage on purpose. With Dr. Fauci testifying this week that reopening too soon may cause an outbreak, and some states already reopening anyway, it appears that our public health is losing and magical thinking is winning. I'm not confident that the time of coronavirus will be the reckoning moment of our post-truth era, although, of course, it should be. We can all make a difference here in being the people in our network of friends and family to respectfully speak the truth whenever we have the chance. It doesn't sound like much, and we know it can be uncomfortable and awkward. But rebuilding trust in public discourse, one conversation at a time, is essential. We owe it to each other as citizens in this society together. Stand up for truth. It matters. Next week, our guest is George Lakoff. He's an emeritus professor of cognitive science and linguistics at UC Berkeley, who has been researching the language of politics in which we reside. His books include the all-new Don't Think of an Elephant, Whose Freedom, and Moral Politics. If you negate a lie, what you're doing is highlighting the lie. So if Trump tells a lie and you simply negate it, all you do is say, no, it's not true that blah, blah, blah. What you're doing is you're saying, ah, think of the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, you're helping him whether you're for him or against him if you just negate. So what choice do you have? The choice that you have is what I call a truth sandwich. We talk about how the truth matters to our democracy, why we must frame first and frame with the truth, and how important repetition is for our brains to accept and believe the framing of any issue, regardless of whether it's true or false. Until next time, stay engaged. I'm Mila Atmos. Thank you for listening to Future Hindsight. The executive producer and host of this program is Mila Atmos. The audio producer and music composer is Peter Fedak. The associate producer is Miriam Zumbu. Additional production by Brooke Sayan. Listen to us online at futurehindsight.com or your favorite streaming service. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.